Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, you can find that in your pew Bible in front of you on page 873. That hymn that you just sang is a hymn written by John Newton. We know John Newton from his famous hymn, Amazing Grace, but this one as well is so rich as we see and understand the Lord's work in our life. Luke chapter 14, we will begin reading in verse 17, or 7 and going to verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the place of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brother or your relative or rich neighbors, lest also they invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just." Thus far, the reading of God's holy word, you may be seated. If you've been to a Braves game, then you know that they do a contest oftentimes between innings. I'm not sure if they do this particular contest every game, but I've seen it a number of times when I've been there. It's called the seat upgrade. When they take someone from the nosebleed section, the 400 section, the very top, and allow them to win tickets right in the front, right by the field. In other words, they take these people from the the tippy top of the stadium where the players look like ants on the field to almost the front row. And it's a, a fun contest, as you can imagine, but I wish they would up the ante, as it were, just a little, that the seats that someone could win could be someone's actual seats, that the person from the back could move to the front, and the person that was in the front would then move all the way to the back. That would make a little bit more intrigue. It would put a little more skin in the game, as it were. And everyone in the front section should know that you might be sent packing. Your tickets might be given up to someone who didn't pay for them. Now, you understand that no professional team would ever do this, would they? Why? Because the people in the front are their top paying customers. Everything is catered to them. But also because there would be such an outrage from this group that it would be overwhelming. What do you mean I need to go all the way back there? Do you know who I am? Do you know how much I've paid for these seats? There would be a protest For sure. Well, that same outrage that would happen in that scenario was no doubt the outrage and offense that Jesus' listeners would have had with this teaching that is before us this morning. Because Jesus speaks of a seat upgrade as well as a seat downgrade. And human nature is such that we will always take a seat upgrade, won't we? But what happens when we are downgraded? What is our reaction when we don't get what we quote unquote deserve? More importantly, what if we downgraded on our own initiative? Would we ever even think of doing such a thing as this? Well, Jesus makes it very clearly that his followers do not put themselves first, but rather last. That the kingdom of God is for the humble and for the generous, 
and that the proud and the stingy and the self-promoting need not apply. In fact, such that live in this manner exclude themselves from the kingdom of God entirely. And so Jesus here has us to focus on how we first and foremost see ourselves as well as how we see others as his followers. And so we'll see this passage in two points, the place of honor and then the people of honor. First, the place of honor. Just to be reminded of the context, Jesus was invited to the Pharisee's home, a ruler of the Pharisees, on the Sabbath. And we saw that last week, perhaps attending synagogue together and then coming over to this Pharisee's house. As we saw last week that the Pharisees watched him closely, not to learn from him, but to trap him. And seemingly they had a man there that was in need of healing. And they had him there specifically so that they could try to trap him, knowing that Jesus was a compassionate man, knowing that Jesus had the power to heal and to see if Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. And so Jesus did heal on the Sabbath and in so doing corrected their Sabbath view. But we also noticed that they were unmoved by it. They remained silent. They would not concede in the wrongdoing or their wrong attitude or even their wrong actions. And Jesus so clearly showed them that they were indeed in the wrong. So Jesus determined to dive deeper does just that. He continues to put his finger on the problem. The more I have studied the life and ministry of Jesus, I am always amazed that he always knows the real issues at hand. And then he goes about exposing it, hitting the nerve as it were. And he does the same to us as well. The Lord never leaves any stones unturned in rooting out our sin. And we need to know that sometimes much to our own chagrin. Sometimes we would like Jesus to just kind of leave us alone, let us kind of have these pet sins as it were. But I will tell you, even from personal experience and no doubt the experience that you've had in your own life, if you've walked with the Lord at any time or any length, of the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus that is with us through his Spirit, will always get into your business, as it were. And you should expect nothing less. We can run, but we can never hide. Because if you are his, he will not leave you alone. And we see that here in this passage, don't we? That they were unmoved, they were silent, they were stubborn in their response. They were, in one word, prideful. And as a result, Jesus continues to push the point, doesn't he? Instead of submitting to Jesus, instead of submitting to the teaching of God because they were prideful of heart, Jesus turns the subject matter, turns the teaching to what? You guessed it. Pride. Specifically, the places of honor, that they were seeking the prominent seat. And it says that Jesus told them a parable. Now notice, it says that they told them a parable to those who were invited when he noticed what they were doing. If there was ever a verse that sanctioned people watching, this is it. And I appreciate that because I love people watching. As Pastor Myers mentioned, the, the Smiths and Myers went to the Ligonier Conference this week, and we flew down there, and so at the airport, at the conference, I didn't need to have my phone out. I didn't need to have my phone to be entertained. I am fully entertained by the people that are around me. No doubt you are as well. And Jesus was doing the same here. Jesus was people watching, as it were. And it says that he noticed that they chose the place of honor, that they were jockeying for position, as it were, in the home of this Pharisee. 
Now, what would that have looked like in first century Jewish context? Well, most likely in this home, the, the table where they sat would have been a large table, and it was U-shaped. And, and the, the place of honor was at kind of the bottom of that U. Why is that? Because everyone would be to your right and everyone would be to your left. And everyone could see you. Oftentimes, this was the place that was reserved for the host. And so everyone was trying to get as close to the host as they possibly could. Closer to him, the better, they thought. And no one wanted to be at the the end of the table. No one wanted to be not even on the table. They wanted to be in that place of prominence, the seat of honor. Now, we don't have these U-type tables in our context, but all of us know the feeling, perhaps at Thanksgiving dinner, of being placed at the kids' table and what that feels like. Or going to a work luncheon and being excluded from the, the head table or the important people's table and having to sit at a side table. And it hurts, doesn't it? Because it makes us feel unimportant unloved, uncared for, that we are kind of a a nobody. But what if you sat at that important people's table and then you were asked to move for someone else? How humbling that would be. You'd probably be looking on the job search website by the end of the day, wouldn't you? Because you would say, there's no future here for me. Now imagine if the opposite happened. You sat at the side table and the the boss said, so-and-so, I I want you to come sit over here. I want you to be a part of this conversation. I want you to be a part of this strategic planning. What a boost. You'd feel valued. You'd feel needed. That would be a good day at the office, wouldn't it? And so Jesus gives a, a very practical piece of advice here, doesn't he? He says, when you're invited, he specifically mentions a wedding feast. He says, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited. And he invited you, both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will go with shame to the lowest place. But when you're invited, go sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he might say to you, friend, move up higher. This is a very practical piece of advice, and it it really deals with the subject of honor and how we're to think about honor. And what is it about human nature that so desires and craves honor, specifically the the seat of honor or the, 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 the place or position of prominence? You understand this, right? Most of you work in corporate America. It's all about how you can ascend the ladder and assume the greater titles. So the question is, is honor or promotion or recognition wrong? Perhaps even sinful? Well, I would say no, of of course not. The Bible, in fact, talks quite extensively about honor, how we are to, to give honor. But the problem because, becomes when we think that we deserve honor or be given the place of prominence, that we are owed it. Now, is there a certain context where you are owed honor? Well, I would say to you both yes and no. For example, in the home, we ought to have our children show us as parents Honor, right? Because of the the fifth commandment that says, children, honor your father and your mother. We are teaching them, we are instructing them to show honor and respect to those in authority over them. And obviously that fifth commandment extends farther than the home, that there are positions of honor, that we are to give honor to those that are above us and over us. And perhaps you are in such a position as a parent, perhaps you are in such a position in your work that you deserve honor. But the position deserving honor and the person deserving honor 
I believe are two different things. What do I mean by that? Let me try to explain it this way. My brother-in-law, a career military man, and he was once mentioning that not of the, all of those that were of a superior rank over him were always the most pleasant people. Probably not much different than some of your bosses or managers that you have. And so I asked him the question, was it hard to submit to their commands? And I remember what he said. He said, in the military, you salute the position, not necessarily the person. You salute the position, not necessarily the person. And I think that is a good understanding of how we think of this aspect of authority, of honor. We ourselves might be in position of authority. We might be in a position of respect, of honor, and oftentimes that is a waiting responsibility. But when we think that it is because of who I am, that I deserve honor, that I deserve notoriety, that's when I believe pride can very much enter into our heart. We're no longer operating in the capacity that we should because we may be in various positions, various degrees, as I mentioned, of responsibility, even honor. But no matter the position, the work is always the same for all of us, and that is of a servant. Christ calls us as his followers to be servants. Servants to others, servants to himself. We are called to serve. Whatever position you are in, if you are in first in the, in the corporation, or if you are at the very tippy top of the very ladder, or you are the last rung on that company's ladder, your work is the same. It is to serve. In whatever capacity that God has called you to serve, that is the way that you should look at it. We, as Jesus' followers, are servants. In glory, Jesus is not going to look over your resume and go, wow, that's impressive. No, rather he's going to ask, really he will already know, how you have used that impressive resume, as it were, for his glory or for your own? Have you used it selfishly or servantly? And so, as a result, we ought to take our positions and our work very seriously, whatever it is. But we ought not to take ourselves so seriously. If we do, it most likely comes from a place of pride and not Humility. That is why in our mission statement as a church, the one that you know, it's on, printed on the back of your worship guide that we want to know and grow and show. And that last one, the show, says that we are to show forth the love of God as what? Servants and witnesses. As servants and witnesses. We're to show forth the love. Jesus says in John 13, 35, they will know that you are my disciples by your love. Not merely because we talk a lot about love, but because we show love. We show forth the love. And how do we do that? Primarily in being a servant. In fact, I would say to you, that is perhaps the greatest witness that you can have. How can you be a witness in the workplace is when you show forth the love of God by being a servant, by being humble, by putting others before yourself. In a world that is always trying to climb the ladder and do so by putting others down, by slandering others, by criticizing their work in order to get a leg up, we have the opportunity as servants and witnesses to say, I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to do it by that basis because I'm submitted to another master. I'm submitted to another boss, and that boss is the Lord. And he calls me to be a humble servant. I'm not going to take the place of honor. I'm not going to take the seat of honor. I'm not gonna take the place of prominence, but rather I'm going to take the lowest position, that of a servant, by putting others before myself. And you might say, Pastor, that sounds good from the pulpit. 
that's not going to get you anywhere in the world. If you have that attitude, you're, you're, you're never going to make it in the place that I work. Well, let me ask, are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? Are we going to build our kingdom or are we going to build the kingdom of God? Are we going to try to glorify ourselves or are we going to try to glorify God? Now, it doesn't mean you can't be promoted or won't be promoted, but when seeking promotions or even when given the opportunity to be promoted, you need to ask the question, why? Is that going to help me serve others, serve God, or is it just going to serve myself? And those are the kind of things that we need to think. That's kind of the worldview that we, we need to have. Don't just take it just because it gives you a greater title or even necessarily a greater pay. Do it because you can better serve your fellow man and better serve your God with the gifts and the skills that he has given to you. Let me demonstrate this. Let me give you an example. And if you've been with us on Sunday night for our evening worship, which I encourage you to do because it's so beautiful how these texts from the Old Testament and the New Testament just, they, they jive together. It's almost like they were written by the same author. <laughs> hint, hint. Of course they were. And, and the principles here are so beautifully demonstrated in First Samuel chapter 1. If you've been with us, you know that the, the kingdom of Israel has been removed from Saul. And God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons. And we just saw this last week that David was overlooked by Samuel. He was forgotten by his father, but he was not overlooked or forgotten by God. David is out watching the sheep, and Samuel asks, do you have any other sons? And, and Jesse, his father, goes, oh, yeah, that's right. David, out in the, in the sheep field. And Samuel says, call him here. And when he does, the Lord says to Samuel, this is he. And David was anointed the king of Israel, the youngest, the last, the least of his brothers from that little town of Bethlehem. Does that sound familiar to you? And you might say, well, David had nothing to do with his birth order, and that is true. But David wasn't the least just in his family. He demonstrated it by his actions. And you might say, how? Well, once he was anointed, what was he called to do? He was called to be a servant of King Saul, the very one that he was going to replace he was called to play the liar for Saul. He was called to be one of his armor bearers. And what is amazing is that even though David knew this is the one that I'm going to replace, he doesn't just serve Saul with bitterness, resentment, with sulking, with reluctance. No, he does it with utmost devotion. And he doesn't do it just for a few weeks not even a few years. Most commentators believe that David was 15 when he was anointed. He did not become king of Israel until age 30. That means for 15 years, he had hard, humble service to not a very nice guy, to one that not only threatened his life, but tried to take his life. I know some of you have a very hard job None of you had a spear that was flung at your head this week. David did, didn't he? He was willing to wait for the Lord's timing, wasn't he? Not his own, not to promote himself. I believe it's Francis Schaeffer that says, we should never seek places of prominence or positions of prominence unless pushed into it. And he says, beware of those that push themselves into such position, even within the church. And as you know, David was a Christ-like figure. The humility of our Lord. Jesus Christ was on full display throughout his ministry, throughout his life, wasn't it? We talk about one that should have been given the place of honor. It would have been Christ. Even within this Pharisee's home, he should have been given the place of honor and prominence, and yet he never sought it, and he never demanded it. Rather, he took the lowest place. But she demonstrated so beautifully at the Last Supper as he 
washes his disciples' feet, the lowliest of the low servant positions. And that was just a mere picture of the greatest act of humility that this world would ever see, that Jesus would not only submit to an unjust legal system to some sham charges, but he would be punished in the most humbling and humiliating way and manner. On the cross between two thieves, and not only that, to be buried, that the God of all life would submit to death for three days. Why? Well, he did it for self-promoting, honor-seeking, prideful people like you and like me. And so why are we called to be servants and not be exalted and prideful because the greatest of these became the least for our salvation? Therefore, what a great irony that we would think of ourselves more highly than we ought. That is the anti-gospel, isn't it? The gospel is that he became the least for us. And we are called in the light of that salvation to do the same, to be foot washers of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Again, this is so opposite in our doggy dog world. But if you've learned anything from the gospel of Luke, it's this that the principles of the kingdom are different, aren't they? In fact, they are the exact opposite of the ways of the world. And here in verse 11, Jesus gives the summary of his parable. It is a kingdom principle, one that we need to remember. In fact, it's a kingdom promise. He says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Notice it doesn't say they may be humbled or they may be exalted or they might be. No, they will be. It is a fact. And so it is the reason why we do not seek our own, why we can be humble, because we know that the Lord will exalt us in due time, will exalt us by uniting us with the exalted one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and salvation in him. Well, not only do we not take the place of honor, but we see second then the people of honor. Jesus makes this conversation very personal. Notice it went from speaking to those that were invited to verse 12, to the man who invited him. He speaks to this Pharisee, the one that was his host. Notice, what does he say to him? Well, he says, essentially, that when you give a dinner or a banquet like he had just done, he says, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, but rather invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Now, why does Jesus say this? Well, it's really a carry-on of the teaching that he just said in verses seven through 11, that the idea of being humble and being the least will be the greatest, and that this is not an abstract thought or this is not an abstract teaching. These are not hypothetical persons somewhere out there. No, he gives the list, doesn't he, that we are to exalt, that we're supposed to give attention to those that are crippled, lame, blind, and poor. Now, Jesus was essentially saying to this Pharisee, I know that you invited that man to try to trap me, that man that had dropsy or edema. Jesus says, if you knew who I was, then you would have invited a room full of him. You would have invited a room full of those that could have been healed, that could have been helped, Instead, who did you invite? You invited a room full of those that thought they had no need at all. Rather, those that were seemingly self-sufficient. And remember, these people did not respond to Jesus' teaching. They remained silent. As Jesus taught, they thought, "Who's, who's he talking to? He's not talking to me, surely not. They had prideful hearts. Jesus says the the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, the very least, 
they know that they have a need. They know that they need help, especially in a world where there was no ADA or medical or technological devices that would have helped them in their handicapped position. They knew that they needed others. And it is in that need for others that they could recognize their greatest need, their need for salvation, their need for a savior. That's why Jesus is earlier in Luke chapter five. It's not those that are healthy that need a doctor, but those that are sick. And it goes on to say, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And we know that there are none righteous But that is exactly what the Pharisees thought, that they were righteous, that they were healthy, they were not in need of a doctor. They thought of themselves well, in fact, too well. And the principle here is the same. No, it's the sick that are honored. And those that are honored or think of themselves in an honorable way are the ones who are actually sick and remain sick. You understand the role reversal yet again, don't you? And so the question needs to be asked again, how do we think of ourselves? Do we think of ourselves like these Pharisees? Do we think of ourselves as well, maybe too well? Or do we think of ourselves as great great in need, those that are sick? And that perspective will change everything, every way of how you view yourself, how we, what way you view others. And that is the point that Jesus is trying to get across, isn't he? That if we see ourselves as the lowest, as servants, then we'll seek to serve. And we'll seek to give. Give to those in a way that will serve them. We will not seek to to give to those that will only benefit us or, or will receive something back in return, those that can repay you, return the favor as it were. You notice that, verse 14. He says, if you do this, you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. If you give only to get, that's viewing people very transactionally. You're viewing people selfishly. You're not serving in a way that Jesus would have you to serve with the kingdom principle that is before you. No, we do not give to get. No, we give to give. Why? Because that's how we've been given to. We have been given to in a way from Jesus, in a way that Jesus did not expect to to get something that he didn't already have. Remember, he was God. He is self-sufficient. He is not in need of any of us. And Jesus didn't look at this crowd. He didn't look at us and say, what can I gain from these people? What can I get from them? Rather, he looked at them. He looked at us and says, no, it's what I will lose for their sake. And as we know, he lost his very life so that we could gain everything. That is the gospel. If we have Christ, what else do we need? What else do we lack? We lack no good thing, therefore we can willingly submit to him whatever our lot, whatever our station in life the Lord has given to us. We are called to be servants, to give to give, not give to get. We can be humble servants of the King of kings and Lord of lords and advance his kingdom. And so let me ask you very poignantly this morning, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as first and foremost, or do you see yourself as the chief of sinners, the least and the last? How do you see yourself and your role in the world? Do you see yourself as a servant of self or a servant of others and a servant of God? How do you see others, that there's something to gain from them or there's someone to give to? How do we practically see that play out in our life? Does it come in an attitude in a manner of pride or does it come in an attitude in a matter of humility? If we're honest with ourselves, We need to recognize it's a mixture, isn't it? But we pray by the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of sanctification that it would be a sliding scale, wouldn't it? 
that we would go from first to last, that we go from self to Christ, that we go from gain to give, that we go from pride to humility, and that the Lord would reward us for this attitude and for this perspective because the Lord will not give up on us until our sanctification is complete in the day of redemption. And let us not forget the promise that those that humble themselves will be exalted or even as he says again in verse 14, he says that you will be blessed for you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just. We may be overlooked by others in this world. We may be forgotten. Yes, that may be the consequences, but the Lord will never overlook, will never forget those that live their lives in such a manner, that live their lives for the kingdom of God. As we close this morning, let me encourage you to pick up a book on this subject matter by Francis Schaeffer, and it's called The Lord's Work in the Lord's Way. The same title as our sermon this morning. It's a very short, it's a very easy read. You can read it in one sitting, I promise you. It's a great Sabbath read. And at the very end of this book, Francis Schaeffer warns us of this, and it's very applicable to us. And I say it's very applicable to us because Schaeffer was a part of our denomination. He was a Presbyterian. He was part of the PCA. And he says this, and we need to hear it close clearly and closely. He says, we can have the correct theological positions, true biblical orthodoxy and purity within the church. And he goes on to say, that is essential. And he says, we can understand our day and age. That's the idea of contextualization, and we must. But he goes on to say this, but by themselves, they'll only lead to pride. If at the very heart, the inner circle, he says, the inner core must lie a humble heart which comes from the love of God and servanthood towards him. He said only that's a living and alive relationship with God. You hear what Schaefer says? He says, yes, orthodoxy. Yes, knowing the world around us. But at the core must be love. The core must be humility, must be the heartbeat of it all. It's the very same thing that the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, didn't he? Without love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Let me put it in the words of Schaefer. Without love, I'm a noisy orthodox gong or a clanging contextual cymbal. May that not be of us. Yes, we love doctrine. Yes, we love purity. Yes, we love theology. Yes, we love understanding our world and how we apply it, but may it all come from a heart of love, from a heart of humility like our Savior. Because when we do, and for so many of you, this is your reality in so many ways. It's such a blessing to be a minister and a pastor of this church because you do what Jesus says here. You humbly serve without care of of self, without care of of recognition, your faithful, humble servants. And I commend you for it. In fact, Jesus commends you for it. But Schaefer ends with this. He says, when we do have this heart of love, he says, then at the end of the life, you'll be able to say, when I look back over my work, since I've been a Christian, I will see that I have not wasted my life because the Lord's work will have been done in the Lord's way. Or perhaps maybe we can end by saying what Jesus would say at our very end, the end of the race, when we see him in glory, well done, good and faithful servants of mine. Enter into your master's joy. What a gift to have a life that is not wasted, but use it in service to the Lord with humility and love. Oh, may the Lord grant us his grace, grant us his spirit, that we may do the Lord's work in the Lord's way. Amen. Join me in prayer.
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this convicting word because when we recognize our own heart, it is a heart of pride, the heart of self-promotion, of putting ourselves first. But Lord, that kingdom principle reverses all of that. It puts it on its head and has us to recognize, indeed, those that exalt themselves will be humbled on the last day, and those that have humbled themselves will be exalted. Lord, we desire to be a part of that group that will be exalted, and that comes by being humble now, not in a way to try to gain exaltation by any means, but as a way to show forth your glory, to be servants of yours, to be, Lord, Christ followers, that pick up our cross daily and follow you, that die to self in order to serve you, O Lord, and to serve our fellow man. Lord, help us in this. We need your grace. We need your spirit. And we thank you, O Lord, that you do indeed provide all of these things for us. Bless us in it, we pray. We pray this in Christ, our Savior's name. Amen.